Our scripture reading today is from Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 7 through 11. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn away from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. <clears throat> and you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus have you said, Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, <clears throat> I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil's way, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Chapter 20. Sermon scripture is from Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 20. Verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, Take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Verse 18. Truly, I tell you, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for it, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. This is the word of the Lord and his people. Thanks and praise be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your people. Lord, as your word says in Jeremiah 15, 6, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. Lord, let the meditation of our hearts, the words of my, that come out of our mouth, be acceptable and pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. Teach us, speak to us, be with us in the midst. Live. tell you a, a story. Once upon a time, a man lived in a beautiful house. His house was well decorated. His lawn was well mowed, nice and green, well painted house um, with uh, good barricades and, and walls. 
a beautiful house. There lived another man next to his house. He was a little messy. He doesn't mow his lawn. Uh, a lot of weeds and insects. Once in a while when he mows his lawn, he would pile up all the, the leftover grass, weeded grass in a corner. What happens is when the wind blows, it all flies into this beautiful house the man was taking care of. Every day, time after time, like he has thought about it, like he wanted to talk to this neighbor and get this problem resolved. And uh, he doesn't know where to start. And he was, he was getting mad and upset and angry at this neighbor. And then there came another tenant uh, who lived the, on the other side of this. So the house A, house B, house C. House A is well kept. House B is messy, not well kept. House C, a new tenant moved. So he noticed house B, man was so messy. And over a time period, he noticed and he prayed and he talked to this man. And then the problem was resolved. And uh, the, the house C man suggested a, a lawnmower and a caretaker of the house. And then he fixed all of the issues. And then house A, the man who lived in house A, was happy about it. His conflict was resolved by this man who came new in house C. We all face conflict. You might have a neighbor who is messy like that, who you share a fence with. You wanted to talk to them or you don't know where to start, what to do. Here in this passage, we also see a similar type of conflict. What would you do if your brother or sister sins against you at church? Sins against you at your place, at your house, or maybe your neighbor sins against you. What would you do? How do you handle the conflict? We all know conflict is not new been there right from Genesis chapter 1 all the way. We see it in our day-to-day -day life. And uh, situations, circumstances all give uh, a way, a segue to conflict. Because we all are different, isn't it? We all have our own thoughts. Um, we have our own perception and perspective. Uh, with all of that said, we are different people. We think differently, and we have our own context. It all matters, to, and it will lead to a conflict. The reality of life is we all face conflict. We all face conflict. There's no life without conflict, particularly in church, as passage talks about. We do have conflict time to time. There's a famous statement uh, said, two or three Baptists gathered together, uh, we have more than three or four opinions, or maybe more. The question is, how do we face the conflict? The reality is we all have to face the conflict in our life. No matter what, conflict is real. How do we face the conflict? Naturally, our thoughts change. And then we get into an argument. Our approaches are different. Our expectations are different. Our goals are different. It all leads to conflict. Our intentions are different. Everything varies from time to time. Change. Ken Thomas and Ralph Kilman from the University of Pittsburgh are the pioneers of conflict management. Conflict management. They presented five models of conflict management. Five models. First one, competing or competition, which is like, I would say, it's like a shark. You go and you attack the person or you compete. You, you move in a race, like you're running a race. 
the, the whole point is the goal is very important for that person and you compete. The relationship is not important for that person who's competing, who's in a mode of competition. Two is collaborating. It's like an owl. How the goal is very important and also the relationship is very important. Keeps an eye and try to make a consensus and try to resolve the problem. Collaborating. Try to come to a same page to resolve and finish what's signed. What's the goal? And third one is avoiding. Most of the times we try to avoid the conflict. It's like a tortoise. You know, what a tortoise does when you try to go grab the tortoise, it would just like go inside. Try to shell itself. Try to protect itself. Man closes up. We all close up ourselves and try to avoid the conflict. And in, in avoiding, the goal and is um, the relationship. The goal is uh, not important. The relationship is not important. Accommodating, fourth, is like a teddy bear. Very soft nature. You know, nice and calm. Don't want to deal with conflict. Just let's keep the peace, you know. Soft and pleasing. The goal is not important, but relationship is very important. They look for harmony. They want to keep peace between parties. And finally, fifth one is compromising. It's like a fox, I would say. Smart, cunning sometimes. The goal is important and relationship also important. Why do I say all of this? This is a worldly way of handling or thinking and processing about conflict management. But the Bible teaches today something more advanced, which is given to us by Jesus more than 2,000 years ago. It's none other than reconciliation. The Bible teaches us very unique effective, efficient way of handling the conflict. It resonates and we can relate with our day-to-day -day life. Reconciliation. Have you ever thought about that? Here in what Jesus says in reconciliation in this passage is the goal is very important, most important. The relationship is also most important. Most important. I want you to think of think for a moment. Do you have a conflict in your life? Are you facing a conflict in your life? Are you part of that conflict in your life that you're dealing with right now? I want to ask, what is it? Have you thought about that? Maybe with a family, maybe with a friend, maybe with your neighbor, co-worker, or a boss, or maybe somebody at the church you're dealing with. I want to ask, how are you handling it? How are you handling it? Here in this passage, we know the context that um, the context talks about Childlikeness of a believer. Jesus is still in Capernaum. He's doing his ministry, preaching about the kingdom of God, healing people. The chapter begins with disciples asking a question in verse 1. Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus highlights who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus highlights the importance of Humility, which is a key to this passage. Jesus emphasizes humility is very important in this whole chapter. That unity and harmony among the fellow believers is very essential in the church. Very essential for God's people. We often fail to um, practice humility in our life. Sometimes 
we offend others knowingly or unknowingly. Sometimes uh, we behave in such a way that uh, we don't even realize that we offended somebody, we hurt somebody. You know, uh, from Old Testament, the signs of ignorance in Numbers 15.22 points out David himself prayed to deliver, be delivered from secret faults. The faults that are hidden from our own eyes. Psalm 19.12 also points that. Coming back to the question, what should we do if we have known that our brother or our sister has sinned against you or us? Let's dive into verse 15. Verse 15 reads, If your brother or sister, fellow disciple, fellow believer, go uh, sins, the word sin in Greek is amartia. Miss the mark, it would say. If you know a uh, bow and arrow, you're trying to aim at a, a specific center point in the board. If you try to release the arrow, if you miss the mark, the center point, you miss the mark. You're out of the center point of what you have to hit. We all miss the mark. Sin. If your brother or sister sins, it says, go and point out their fault. Just between two of you. Here we notice, um, in the context we know, when Jesus talks about child, childlikeness. If you know, uh, you all have seen children. Children, most of the children disobey if you give them some instructions. That's pretty common. I've done it. I've been there. When child disobeys here in America, uh, you just say, very, don't do it. But back in India, first you get a spank. And then they'll tell you, don't do it. You know, children need to be corrected if they do something wrong, which is for their good, you know. Like we talked last week, uh, how back in school, kids are excited to go to school and get struggle in studying. You know, children are disciplined in school and in life for their goodness, for their better growth in their life, for their betterment to grow in their life, to be a good man or a woman. And they do, when they do a mistake, they need to be corrected for their betterment. For their goodness. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, it talks about the context of opposition of false teachers. You see, false teachers. It says, the goal of this command is love, which is the center, which comes from pure heart and a good conscience, conscience and sincere faith. Here, it points to the center, the the nail that's being hit right on the spot is the love. To place love as the center when we deal with conflict in our life. When you're trying to go confront somebody of their sin, place love as the center. Here we notice the effort to win back in this passage. We, we, the main motive is not to uh, win an argument. The main motive is to win back your brother or your sister. 2 Timothy 3, it, it also highlights about the correction and instruction of how if someone in church fails and sins. He or she needs to be restored to fellowship, to the church. See, in verse 15, it talks, go and point out their fault. Go and tell, point out, show their fault. Convict him one-on-one -on -one first, one-on-one. -on -one. Between two of you, the passage we read from Ezekiel, that, uh, the supporting scripture that we read in Ezekiel 33, 7 through 11, God tells Ezekiel, 
I have made you a watchman. It says, I have made you a watchman of the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. In verse 7, it says, what does a watchman do? I don't know. Uh, you can call watchmen back home. We have Gurkhas, who will be a person who goes around the neighborhood and he would whistle. You just whistle and goes around to make an alert to the robbers or thieves around uh, to protect people. Watchmen. Or maybe in a school, you have a watchman uh, in an office. It's like a security guard. What does he do? He protects. You know, here in Ezekiel, God wants to protect the sinners. Sorry, protect people from sinning. I'm sorry. Protect people from sinning. He doesn't want you to sin, particularly in church, in the context of church. Here we come to church to hear the word of God, to be transformed, to overcome sin that we are dealing in our lives. How do we overcome it? If you don't realize we are sinning, the word of God convicts it. And also it says, the Bible says, fellow brother or sister can confront here. He invites us to be the watchman. He invites us to protect your brother or sister or a family member, believer. What is the job of a watchman? To avoid to recognize the sins that's coming ahead, to defend, to protect, to defend. We are all invited to be the watchman, to be a brother or sister who cares, who loves the other person. We do this to point out and reconcile them from wandering away from God. You know, you all might have heard about a story in Genesis. Cain and Abel, famous story. What happens is Cain and Abel, you know, Cain kills his brother Abel. In Genesis 4.9, what does God say in verse 4.9? It says, when Cain killed Abel, Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? There is your brother Abel. And I said, I do not know, he replied. Cain replied. Am I, brother, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's watchman? And God himself questioned Cain and he sinned. One on one. Right from Genesis, we know we need to care for our brother, sister. We need to show them love, not enmity, not an argument, but reconciliation, love, care. I tell you, I'll tell you, sometimes one-on-one -on -one reconciliation is tough. It's really tough. Especially when you're in going through emotions in your life. It can lead to an argument. You don't, know, you don't know where to start. Often you are so angry, you're so upset of someone doing wrongdoing to you, sins against you. But you are invited here to love your brother or your sister when it comes to conflict. I'll tell you a, a statement. It is possible, it is definitely possible to win an argument. It is definitely possible to win an argument. You can win it and lose your brother or sister. You can win an argument in the midst of winning your argument. You can lose your brother or sister. God doesn't want our brother or sister to be walked away from faith. 
most of, most of the times, it's exactly what happens. When we don't know how to confront, how to point out someone's sin in love, we say it bluntly, and we gossip around, and the person listens, and they, they walk away, one from church sometimes, and two from their faith, they walk away. It is very important to talk to them in love. Galatians 6 1 says, We must have a spirit of meekness and gentleness and love to restore the situation that you're dealing with conflict. We're moving down to verse 16, second. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along. So they are very the, so that very every matter may be established by testimony of two or three witnesses. One or two others along. It's like asking for help. If you don't know how to dialogue with one-on-one, -on -one, if you're so afraid, you're so upset, angry, approach someone for help, one or two. Fellow believers. Very important in approaching this one or two fellow believers. One, they should be trustworthy. They should be godly and prayerful. And they should be honest. Not gossiping around. 2 Corinthians 13, 1. Paul gives three warnings to the church of Corinth. Particularly here, uh, he talks exactly like bringing two or three fellow believers for reconciliation, to point out a conflict. Bring one or two. In verse 17, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. Tell it to the church. If you think sin is getting out of hand, it's causing trouble, we have to bring it to the attention of the church. Quality. Ask help at church. The goal is still here not to win an argument and make your agenda established, but to win your brother who's being lost, who's being taken over by sin, who's being consumed by Satan. as brother, sister, for reconciliation. You see in Matthew 16, 18, verse 18, we notice the, the second mention of church, ecclesia, right before this in Matthew 16, 18. That's the first mention of church. Uh, we notice um, Peter, mentioned, uh, Jesus mentions to Peter, upon you, I'll build my church upon you, Petros, rock, I'll build my church. Here is the second time we, uh, we notice about the church, ecclesia, a very important word, congregation. Church discipline is highly emphasized in this context, in this passage. If he or she still refuses to repent and reconcile, the Bible says, he cannot be treated as a spiritual brother or sister, rather as a pagan, a Gentile, or a tax collector. Paul clearly here talks about, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he talks about how to treat them if they are sinning, continue to sin. You might ask, okay, this one, two, three-step process that Jesus gave, uh, it's, it looks great, it's excellent. Okay, pastor, how do we approach it? How do we apply in our lives? I'll give you three steps, like Jesus. One-on-one -on -one reconciliation. Where do I start? 
First, pray. It's so obvious, you know, pray. But pray particularly for yourself, first. Two, pray for the person that you're dealing a conflict with, the one who's sinning, your brother or sister. Two, three, pray for the right words to speak to that person. Four, pray for clarity of the situation, what you're dealing with. Clarity like, like still water, a running stream of water, where if you see, look at it, you can see the reflection of your face. Have that sense of clarity. I will tell you, prayer helps us to find God's grace and guidance when you're dealing with sin and conflict. It helps you to relax and think of what God wants you to do in that situation. How to deal with it. And second, I want to say ABC. A, B, C. Simple to say. A stands for attitude. That's your attitude and the other person's attitude. Try to know that. The basic. What motivated this conflict? What is the sin that he or she has committed? Two, B for behavior. Try to know your behavior and other person's behavior. And C is context. Know the context of your conflict. To know all of this is not no ABC and prayer. All of this is great. The whole point is not to blame and win the argument, but to win and reconcile your brother or sister in Christ. Would you do that if you have conflict in your life? Not confrontation, but carefrontation. I don't know if this word is there in the dictionary. I like the word carefrontation. Care for the other person. Love that other person. And third and final one, humility. That's exactly what Jesus talks in this whole chapter of 18. Humility, like childlikeness. No one is perfect, I'll tell you. No one is Mr. Perfect or Mrs. Perfect or Miss Perfect except God, except Jesus. Always speak the truth in love, as it says in Ephesians 4.15. Speak the truth, convict the person in love. That's a key to resolve, confront, to reconcile with your brother or sister who's sinning against you. Verse 18 and 19. Let's dive into that. It says, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is exactly like in Matthew chapter 16. You remember when Peter says, who do you say I am? And Jesus asks to Peter, and Peter would respond, you are the Messiah. You are the Savior. And with that statement, Jesus says, the end, responding to Peter and the disciples. The same verse, similar verse. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This points, this verse 18, points to the church, the ecclesia. Finally, in, in verse 19, we see, again, I truly, I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything and ask for it, it will be done. For them by my Father in heaven. The word agree in Greek word is uh, supreno, which is uh, symf symphino, which is like a symphony. Uh, in symphony, every instrument and every player has to sync to the dictator. 
a conductor, has to sing. Same word, agree. You need to have a consensus in the church about to resolve the conflict. Primarily used uh, in symphony, the same word. Agree. How do we agree? Like I said, prayer. Agree in prayer with the fellow brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, not in some pastor's name or some deacon's name. In Jesus' name, pray. Concerning the sinner and the sin. We are here, by doing this, we are here reflecting like how it says in Matthew chapter 6. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're reflecting God's work, God's redemption to his people here in church. I think last week I mentioned, as we come here every Sunday, we taste how heaven looks like. We taste how after life, after death looks like. Worshiping God together, praising God together, loving one another, caring for one another. Together, finally, in verse 20, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. It's like a two or three means like a small gathering, you know. Um, if you think about um, if a Bible study, two or three comes to gathering where Jesus is in the midst. I'm with them, in the midst of them. It means God is exercising his authority. This particularly is not about just like two or three uh, meeting at a house and you call that as a church. Here in this context, what it is clearly talking about, it's a small group of people coming together, exercising God's authority, exercising the word of God through the body of Christ to resolve, to reconcile a fellow brother or sister who's being lost, who's, being, who's committing a sin. How do we attend to that? Who erred will end with a story. In my life, I've, uh, I have a friend, a real good friend, who has been behind my back and said a thing that hurt me in school, um, which he, he absolutely went behind my back. I trusted him so much. It is, uh, it is not a sin that I committed. I trusted him of saying uh, my personal thing to him. And he went behind my back and he, for his fame, he announced, he publicized. And people started to laugh at me. And all the time I was so angry and I was so upset. I don't know how to uh, convict him. For years, for years and years, almost like 15, 18 years, all of a sudden, um, after knowing Christ, this passage, uh, I was reading three years back. It convicted me just to call him and say hello. And I wanted to talk to him and try to resolve what I was carrying for many, many years. That's a burden in my heart. And I said, I, I just casually, I didn't even bring that conversation. I casually said, how are you doing? How's things going on? It's been a while. We haven't talked. I enjoyed the time in, in, in our childhood days. And after two or three minutes, I, I said, uh, hey, friend, um, I was so mad and upset at you, what you did to me. So mad and upset at you. 
But you know, after knowing God, I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to reconcile with you. And then he said, sorry. And I said that. We became friends again. That burden that I was carrying for a long time, uh, it's still there. You know, when somebody hurts you, it's, it's like a scar. It will never go away. It reminds you of what happened, the reality of what happened. But it will help you once you release that, once you confront and once you deal with it. It gives you a sense of peace. Even though the scar is there, it, it makes you feel like uh, it's healed. You can see the scar and you can, you can sense that it's healed. Similarly, I had a scar throughout many years in my life. Once I talked to him, even though over the time it kind of healed, once I talked to him, that's when I realized it's healed completely. You know how that, that could happen to me? It's only through God. The Word of God is so powerful convicted me to convict him to resolve and to reconcile and to be healed. Ultimately, to the conflict that we deal in our lives, only God could bring that healing. He's the one who will reconcile. I always talk about the horizontal relationship and the vertical relationship. Horizontal is between people. The vertical is loving God and loving people. It reminds me of, a, of the cross, vertical and the horizontal. If you have a conflict, pray about it. And do the ABC. And then have humility and approach with love to reconcile. Not to win the argument, but win your brother or sister who's being lost, who's sinning against you, who's sinning against God. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, thank you for helping us, guiding us, giving us a three-step process. It's so amazing, Lord, how you speak to us, how your word still applies to us till day in our lives. Thank you, Lord. I ask and I pray in Jesus' name. Because he lives, we can face today, tomorrow, and future. May you have his peace, his grace, and his love. You and people around you, go in peace. Amen.